another week, another question show. So wherever you are on the YouTube channel, watching any video, you've got a question, go ahead, type it in the comments box and I will find it and answer it here. All right, let's get started. Video universe. Hey, I have a question. What happens to a black hole that let's say has the mass of Mars or Jupiter and is next to a star that has 12 masses of the sun? What happens to the black hole? Well, if the black hole is orbiting around the star, then it'll just go around and around and around forever uh, until the star dies. But if the, if the two are sort of side by side and there's not that orbital velocity, then the black hole is gonna fall into the star and make its way down. It's gonna fall through the star and then come back and fall through and eventually find its way to the very heart of the star and then it's gonna gobble up the star from the inside. And eventually you will have a black hole with 12 times the mass of the sun and no more star. Delve. With all the talk of the new proposal for how we should classify a planet, I'd like to know, how would you classify a planet? I'm really not that concerned about the classifications of planets. No classification system is gonna do this justice. When we were children, or when I was a child, there were nine planets, including Pluto. And then Mike Brown, Pluto killer, found Eris. And that meant that there was other objects that, were, that should have the same classification as Pluto. Therefore, they should be planets. But then the International Astronomical Union downgraded Pluto to a dwarf planet with Eris and these other dwarf planets. And now maybe there's a planet nine and there's gonna be a new proposal from, from astronomers that we should have 100 planets. I don't really care. Like I just, I'm not really super concerned about it. Each world is kind of amazing on its own and it's a place and they should have a name, but I'm not really that concerned. The bottom line is, is that the, the textbooks for astronomy have to change. They're, you cannot, you can never go back to, you know, because we've got Eris and maybe planet nine, we're never just gonna have the same nine planets that I grew up with. Everything's gonna be different. And that's sort of the, the part about science is that Everything always changes. So I wouldn't be that concerned about it. Just one is besto. I was watching some Isaac Arthur the other day and it occurred to me that the Northern Rockies might be a good place for a mass driver. Thoughts? All right, three things. One, Isaac Arthur is awesome. If you haven't already, check out his channel. You will absolutely love it. Uh, two, Isaac and Arthur and I did a collaboration a couple of months ago and now we're working on another one. We're brainstorming on the ideas with our patrons right now. So if you're a patron of mine or a patron of Isaac Arthur's, find the feed and join us in the conversation as we figure out what that two-part episode is going to be. Number three, <clears throat> yeah, mountains are the best place to put mass drivers. You want some kind of system that will launch stuff into space electromagnetically, mountains are the way to go. Ideally, you want a mountain that is as closely located to the equator as possible. There's a few places. One is Mount Kilimanjaro, which is just a couple of degrees off of the equator. And it's sort of a, it's a volcanic mountain. It has a really nice slope to it. So it would be a really good place to house a, to house some kind of mass driver. Uh, the other place is in the Andes. Uh, you know, there's fairly tall mountains, volcanic, that are really close to the equator and might serve as a really good place for a mass driver. So those are the two places that I would go, Africa or South America. Red, yellow, lead, better too. How dense was matter at the Big Bang? How did extremely massive black holes not get created, or did they, could be the ones at the center of galaxies? The density of matter right at the Big Bang, or shortly after the Big Bang, was the entire universe was in a region smaller than an atom. So really dense. Uh, and so you're asking well, like how did black holes not get created? One of the ideas for this, this idea of primordial black holes. So right now, most black holes are formed when massive stars die and they collapse inward and you get a black hole. There are also these supermassive black holes, which could be, they started as a stellar mass black hole and they just accreted more material and more black holes came together and you got stuff with millions or billion times the mass of the sun. But, you know, there's no other natural process that could get you a black hole with less mass. But maybe shortly after the Big Bang, 
you had in space being incredibly compact, very tight together, you could have had these over densities, these folds of space where matter was compressed so tightly that it formed into black holes. You could have got black holes of different sizes. You could have black holes that are, say, have the mass of an asteroid, or the mass of a house, or the mass of a couple of atoms, or the mass of a planet, in addition to the mass, and maybe to the supermassive ones as well. So this is one line of thinking, and some astronomers think a, a, a very far out possibility is that dark matter is actually clouds of these microscopic black holes. But not very many astronomers actually believe this. Bose-Einstein. In light of SpaceX's rapid progress in rocketry, do you think Elon Musk's goal of colonizing Mars in the next few decades is a bit more practical? First, you have to take my answer with a bit of a grain of salt, right? Elon Musk runs a rocket company. They've done the math. They've figured out how to make rockets land. They work. They return to their landing pad. They've got plans for the Falcon Heavy. They've got plans for the, inter, you know, the interplanetary transport ship. In theory, all this stuff is going to work, unless it doesn't. So I, I think that, that the plans to ferry human beings to the surface of Mars is in the works. Now, I, our experience shows us that Elon Musk's time frames seem to, seem to take a little longer than we were expecting, so it might not be that the first human will set foot on 2024, maybe they're going to set foot on 2026, or maybe 2028, or maybe 2032, that it's going to, but it will happen. The deeper question is, how are they going to live? Living here on Earth with the temperatures and the, in the air, you've got all of these things going for you that you're gonna have to come up with completely from scratch on Mars. So there are all of these challenges about just making human beings survive. Is it possible? I think so, yeah. Is it realistic? We don't know yet. We just don't know what all of those intricacies are going to be. So, so right now, the fact that SpaceX launched and landed a rocket tells us that they're serious and they've got some technical chops and we have to just keep following along and see what happens. I love the idea that SpaceX and Elon Musk just thinks big and says, why don't we put 3,000 high-speed internet satellites into space and give everybody high-speed internet? Why don't we switch everything over to solar panels? Like, I think that that idea of thinking big, of of questioning our deeply held beliefs about the way things are done because that's the way they've always been done is right on the money. And, and I wish there were more people out there who thought that way and, and sort of followed their heart and the beliefs of their convictions and didn't just complain about the way things are and the way they always are. We need more people who, who take a stand and say, I'm going to change the world I believe that this, this is a better path and I'm going to come up with a practical way to accomplish it. Do I want to live on Mars? No. No, I want to live on Earth. But I understand that people do want to live on Mars and I really hope that they can get there and be safe and that there can be a self-sustaining colony for a long period of time. M theory. When are you going to launch a new head of hair? Never. Well, unless they come up with some kind of cure for male pattern baldness. I started losing my hair in when I was like 25, 28, and then it's like, you know, for a while you fight it, and then after a while you just go the full Jean Picard and you just shave it and then you just never look back. And I'm sure it won't happen to you too. Just look at your grandfather and that'll tell you whether you're gonna have a full head of hair or whether you're gonna lose it too. VIN 950, is there any way to stay still in one spot in space? Or is it only possible to do so relative to another object? For instance, if we managed to escape Earth's orbit, would we now be orbiting the sun? To get out of our solar system, is there a solar escape velocity? When you say that you are standing still, you've got to ask the question relative to what? Are you, right now, wherever you are, you are standing still compared to your computer screen that you're watching this on right now, but you're not standing still compared to the moon, which is moving going around the Earth and moving a little closer and a little further away. You're not standing still compared to the Sun, which you're going around. 
So you're exactly right. If you were, you know, if you're able to escape Earth gravity, then you are now in solar orbit, and the Earth is moving at 30 kilometers per second around the sun. So you've got 30 kilometers per second of, of speed that you would have to deal with. There is a solar system escape velocity, which is about 16 kilometers per second. In other words, if you can launch off of the Earth and you can get going at 16 kilometers per second, you are going to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. And there is one for the galaxy, and there's one for the local group, and there's one for the Virgo supercluster. There are different escape velocities for different places. Moon Ten Man. Isn't it also quite possible that our type of universe is the only way a universe can be? Do we have any reason to assume that the constants we see can be different? You're talking about this idea of a multiverse. So there could be many universes in each one. The, the properties of the force of gravity and the strong nuclear force and all these numbers are different. But the possibility is that, one, there's no other universes, there's just this universe and the rules, the laws of physics, the constants are just what they are and there's no other kick at the can, right? The other possibility is that our understanding of what a universe constant is, is meaningless in some other universe. Like, not only could there be the force of gravity not exist in this other universe, but there might not even be any concept of the force of gravity. There's gonna be the force of, or something else. Like, like, we can't even imagine what could be going on in these other universes, if they exist, which we can never reach anyway. So it doesn't really make sense to, to sort of constrain that. Now, we, exist in this universe, and there's this idea of the anthropic principle, right? That, that if the laws of the universe didn't happen to be the ones that they are, then we wouldn't be here to be able to observe it. And that makes a ton of sense, that if the laws are in any way different, if, if your parents hadn't met, then you wouldn't exist, that there are all of these, to, to be here to ask this question, right? There's all of these these random occurrences that had to happen to lead up to us being here to have this conversation now. And if, the, if anything was any different, then you wouldn't be here. And if the laws of physics were different, then we wouldn't have, uh, and no species could show up to ask these kinds of questions about what it means like to be in the universe. F2K. While you're talking about the photons escaping the sun, I have a related question. Is the brightness of the sun the result of the photons generated by fusion because, or because the elements are super hot and glow like a giant light bulb. The color of the sun depends on the wavelength of the photons that are being emitted from it. So if you've got a red star, it means that the, the star is emitting largely red photons of a certain color temperature, and that's giving you the color of the star. And in fact, if you touched the, temp, the, the surface of the star, it would be the temperature of those photons. Now, the brightness of the star comes from the amount of photons that are coming off of it. So if it's a small little red dwarf star, then it's going to have the same temperature as a red supergiant, but it's going to have a different amount of photons that are streaming off of it. A torture. I just wanted to know if we can actually transfer our subconscious brain to a form of software, like supercomputers, what type of civilization would that technology be classified in? Just curious. Lol. When we talk about the, what type of civilization, is it type one, type two, type three, we don't really talk about what do the entities that exist in this civilization. If, you, if we could transfer ourselves into robot bodies and then, but we hadn't yet, we might be in robot bodies, but we haven't used up all the power on the earth yet, we still wouldn't even be a type one civilization. But if we were human beings and we had robots and we were building Dyson swarms, then we would be a type two civilization. I feel that it is inevitable that we're gonna develop some kind of merger between computers and human beings. Who knows when it's gonna happen and who knows what technological level, but it feels like, like a, you know, we are just meat computers, so it makes sense that we can eventually connect with silicon computers. See Dalgo. 
I was only a child during the start of the shuttle missions, but wasn't there some controversy involving reusability with the shuttle's boosters? Something like NASA was legally obligated to reobtain them after splashdown, but it was a massive waste of their time and energy. In our SpaceX mission, we talked about how the SpaceX reused rocket shuttle rocket went up, <clears throat> came back to Earth, landed on the launch pad, or landed on a on a barge that was then eventually returned back to the launch pad. That's reusability. But yeah, the space shuttle's solid rocket boosters were reused after the shuttle launches. And in many cases, some of those solid rocket boosters were used dozens and dozens of times. Uh, they were some of the most complicated machines ever built. Uh, they required about 5,000 different parts to be dismantled, serviced and maintained. I mean, when the solid rocket boosters came back to Earth, they used parachutes and they dropped into the ocean. So you got salt water in there and there was a ton of work to bring those solid rocket, rocket boosters back into operation and attach them to a shuttle. With the SpaceX rocket, it's just kind of landing. They're gonna put a new payload on top. They're gonna put more fuel in and it's gonna take off again. So I think that the, the SpaceX method is a lot simpler, a lot more reusable than what had to be done with the solid rocket boosters. But really, the solid rocket boosters were reused rockets of massive potential. And we're going to see them again with the space launch system. Shrub. If a very large star was to go supernova just a few kilometers from a supermassive black hole, would that be enough to launch the black hole out of its galaxy? I know that those black holes can be millions of solar masses, but supernovae are more powerful than I can comprehend. Supernovae are powerful, but supermassive black holes are an incomprehensible amount of mass. Uh, a supernova might contain, say, 12, you know, the star that goes off, maybe say 12 times the mass of the sun, 20 times the mass of the sun, 50 times the mass of the sun. That's a lot, but a supermassive black hole is Mil four million times the mass of the sun, a billion times the mass of the sun, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Like these things are just so much more, more massive than anything, any kind of supernova. The only thing that can kick a supermassive black hole out of a galaxy is another supermassive black hole. These, these galaxies come together, the supermassive black holes interact with each other, and one can kick another one out of its host galaxy. And that's really the only process that will do that. Now, if you have a, like a, a large star with a companion and that star explodes as a supernova, that companion star can be kicked out of the galaxy. But to do that to a, to a uh, supermassive black hole, no. All right, that's it, another week, more questions. As always, wherever you're watching these videos on our channel, just go type in your question about what I talked about in this episode, about the, whatever the show is about, I will find them and I'll answer them here. All right, I look forward to your questions. Mm, my feet are completely frozen. <laughs>